The 3.30 p.m. meeting of the Bakersfield City Council is now in session. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to call to order the 3.30 regular City Council meeting of April 20th, 2022. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Weir. Here. Councilmember Arias. Here. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Gonzalez. I'm here too. <laughs> Councilmember Freeman. <laughs> Councilmember Gray. Here. And Councilmember Parlier. I'm here three. <laughs> Thank you. In keeping with Council's resolution, the public statements portion is now divided into two periods. There's a period for items listed on the meeting agenda and items not on the meeting agenda. Statements for items listed on this afternoon's agenda are given a two-minute time limit, 20 minutes total, per agenda item. Statements regarding items not listed on the agenda are also given a two minute time limit, 20 minutes total. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give them to the clerk who will give copies to the council. If you're here to make a public statement, please fill out a public speaker card and give it to the city clerk. We ask that you mark whether you're here to speak on an item listed on the afternoon's agenda or on a matter not listed on the agenda. Speakers who do not identify the agenda item on which, which they wish to speak will be presumed to be speakers for the non-agenda portion. Those speakers will be called during the non-agenda portion of the meeting. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items listed on this afternoon's agenda? No speaker cards have been received. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items not on the agenda? Mayor Go, no speaker cards have been received for items not on the agenda. Thank you. Next item, please. Reports item 3A, a public safety update and presentation will be provided by Bakersfield Police Chief Greg Terry and by Kern County District Attorney Cynthia Zimmer. Thank you. Mr. Clegg. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council. We're picking up on our public safety update uh, from where we left off last time and very thankful uh, to have Chief and our District Attorney here with us today, and we'll kick it off with Chief Terry, um, and we'll have a, a few other folks um, help uh, participate on the update, and then we'll go to the next presentation after that. Welcome, Chief. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council, Greg Terry, Police Chief, and I will be providing you with uh, a public safety update and looking at, in particular, Part 1 crimes in 2021 as compared to the same time period in 2020. We'll talk about our calls for service and workload. We'll talk about some response times. I'll also uh, share with some, some information on some new uh, partnerships that were developed over the last year. Christy Tinter will be here to uh, also share a, a sort of a staffing update. Uh, and then our district attorney, Cynthia Zimmer, will uh, follow with an update on some uh, similar topics. I wish it was a, a, a better and more pleasant topic to talk to you about this afternoon, but uh, it is a reality of some of the challenges that we are facing in our community, and um, it's important information that we talk about. The first information I want to talk about is the Part 1 crimes. Part 1 crimes are these categorized uh, offenses, they're categorized as violent and property crimes. These are offenses that we report to the FBI on a monthly basis. Uh, and these are the totals for those crimes uh, in 2021 as compared to uh, 2020. Overall, uh, our community experienced at about a 7% increase in total Part 1 crimes. That is the combination of both the violent and the property crimes. Homicide in our community um, continued to rise last year. In 2020, we had 45 homicides, which was a, uh, an unfortunate record for our city. In 2021, that increased uh, to 60. There was about a 30% increase in sexual assault, about a 9% increase in robberies. Um, for the uh, property crimes, there were increases in both uh, larceny and theft and auto theft. Uh, and there was a decrease in burglary for actually the third consecutive year. Um, burglary decreased for about, by about 16% for the third consecutive year, reported burglaries. 
me talk a little bit about the homicides and, and some of the gun violence, and I'll have a little bit more information uh, in just a minute. But uh, our special enforcement unit, which is uh, focused on gun and gang violence, just for some perspective, uh, has already seized over 40% of the total firearms that they, re that they seized in all of last year. So there are a lot of firearms in our, sh in our city. About 70% of our homicides over the last two years have been committed uh, with a firearm. Some, for some more perspective, uh, just in terms of violent crime, about 50% of the people we've arrested for homicide in the last two years uh, had pre prior arrests for serious felonies and absent some legislative or prison reform methods would have been in custody at the time, likely would have been in custody at the time that they committed a homicide. So there are some changes that have been happening over the last several years, and it is certainly impacting our community. Here's some, again, part one crimes um, information as compared to some other cities, Fresno, Modesto, Oxnard, and Stockton. Um, these are the total part one violent crimes, not the total part one crimes. In other words, there's not property crime that's figured into this. These numbers are just for uh, violent crime. To do a little bit better comparison, a more accurate comparison, to look at exactly how much crime is occurring in our city and to be adjusted for population, we look at the crime rate. Crime rate for 2021 is there as highlighted uh, in each of the cities. And as you can see, with what I've just told you, we're still lower than three of the, uh, the five cities that are up there. With Fresno, Modesto, and Stockton having, uh, Modesto and Stockton significantly, having significantly higher crime rates than we did even for violent crime. This graph represents the homicides and non-fatal shootings over a three-year period. And as you can see, the, the, the lines there, the horizontal lines are, are the three-year average for homicides and aggravated assault or gun, uh, which is non-fatal shootings. And as you can see, uh, in 2021, represented by the yellow there, we exceeded the three-year average every month uh, last year uh, for non-fatal shootings. And homicides was close to it, uh, with the exception of just a few months. And I'll show you that to give you some perspective um, on how much uh, crime is occurring and over what period of time. And again, just to provide some context and perspective to what we are seeing. Traffic update. Uh, fatal collisions increased last year as well, uh, 55 over 45 the previous year. The makeup, as you can see, there were increases in vehicle and pedestrian uh, collisions. Um, these all are representative of the fatal collisions that occurred. Our calls for reckless driving, most specifically and most frequently, is related to street racing and that kind of activity. The number of uh, complaints that we received is over 6,000 uh, for the last two years. It did decrease slightly last year uh, versus 2020, and we continue to focus on street racing and conduct numerous operations. Uh, focusing on that, oh, just since March, we've had several operations in conjunction with the CHP. We've uh, issued over 100 citations, impounded over 30 vehicles. Uh, I think in total of last year, we we made over or issued over 200 or 200 citations just for street racing alone or associated uh, vehicle or vehicle code violations, and uh, impounded over 100 vehicles just related to those activities. As the reported number of crimes that have gone up, so have our calls for service. Uh, in 2021, there were over 776,000 phone calls into our communication center, which is about 11% increase year over year. Uh, actual 911 calls in also increased to almost 300,000. Uh, and the actual number of dispatched incidents, so in other words, a call comes in, it's triage, it's understood whether or not we need to actually have a response to it, and then an uh, a incident is created and dispatched, and that also went up by about 4% to almost 250,000. For a little bit more perspective and context, this is the number of priority one calls. This is our highest priority calls. Um, in other words, this is a life-threatening type circumstance. Um, those have continued to increase year over year as well, and those, that goes back to uh, 2018. Shot spotter. Shot, act, shot spotter activations also went up last year, but we also doubled uh, the coverage area within the city. 
the map there in the graph indicates or represents about a six square mile uh, section of the city where shot spotter technology uh, has coverage. The area in red is the expanded coverage that occurred in 2021. So you can see the number of, of activations went up by about 75%, but again, we doubled uh, the area. And this is, this is the area through assessment, analysis, and data where we are experiencing, our community is experiencing the most uh, or the highest levels of gun violence. And yet we know that the vast majority of, of gunshots uh, are not reported. They go unreported. And so uh, one of the goals of ShotSpotter is certainly to make us aware of these incidents so that we can get there quickly, that we can uh, seize evidence, make arrests, and ultimately reduce uh, injuries in our city. But it's also to send a message to um, our community members who live in this area that we are concerned and we understand the impact that this type of activity is having on their uh, on their daily life. Uh, we want them to know that this is important to us. Uh, and so we are encouraging, we, we go out after shot spotter activations, go out and make contact in the, in the area to let the residents know that we're aware of these incidents. We use door hangers, we use a variety of things to recontact the, uh, the residents and let them know that we're aware of these things occurring. But this again, I wanted to provide you some context to let you know just how much uh, this is occurring and where it's occurring. Our average response time to a sh shot spotter activation is about four minutes. Response times. Here are the uh, priority one response times for the six zones across the city. Uh, each of the zones uh, saw an increase uh, with the exception of the metro zone. Actually, it did also just slightly, uh, but they all uh, had an increase in priority one response times. And this percentage really represents uh, what that is. Uh, the lowest increase was in the hill and the valley, which saw an increase of about 1%. But again, for some additional context, when you look at the call volume per zone, uh, you can see that there's a direct correlation almost in every single zone, that the increase in response times also was commensurate with the increase in call volume for each of those zones as well. The only zone that did not have a call volume increase was the south zone. Some new partnerships that we've um, developed over the last year, I'll talk a little bit about that. The first one is the clinician uh, in the communication center. Uh, we know, uh, and our experience has been that there's a, a large number of calls, crisis calls that come into the police department's 911 center that at its core um, does not need a police officer. Uh, at least that's what we had some belief about. And so we wanted to explore whether or not this was a viable theory, and so we partnered with Kern Behavioral Health to put a clinician in the comm center. This clinician is able to have direct contact with the 911 caller. We can triage the calls and find out whether or not this is in fact requires a police response or can this situation be handled uh, with resources that are already available that this person may already be linked to or resources that are already available in the field in some way related to current behavioral health. Uh, since the uh, pilot project has began in August of this year, this was one clinician working uh, on Wednesdays to Saturdays from 2 p.m. to midnight. Uh, she was able to handle just over 350 calls, and about 63% of the time, she was able to resolve the incident or divert it to some other resource without a police response. So we feel like this is a, a very promising project, and uh, you'll hear more about it in our uh, upcoming budget presentation. Another partnership that's just been recently developed, uh, again, with um, uh, Current Behavioral Health is a the launching of a co-response team. We have one officer and one clinician who are out now uh, in the field, and they respond to calls for service. Their primary focus is on homelessness and homelessness-related calls. Uh, for those, uh, they respond to calls for service with someone in crisis, with something, or someone reporting something related to homelessness. Uh, they have... This co-response team, again, has direct links uh, and strong relationships with the variety of outreach partners and teams that we have already in the city. And their job and their, their focus is really trying to get to the root cause of these issues and that are associated with one particular individual or what might be attracting uh, a large number of individuals to a particular area and try to figure out, uh, is there a solution, something that we can do 
environmentally or having other partners come to the table to be able to reduce calls for service to a particular location, but also to reduce calls for service related to a particular individual. Uh, we know that there are, and our, again, our experience has been that there's still a, very often a small number of individuals who are responsible for the most, most calls that we have and really chronic users of this. And that's really been our focus to try to identify who these chronic users of our systems are, who are the sources of these complaints and, and, have, and dedicate some resources that can deal, again, with the criminal side if there needs to be, but also having a, clinici a clinician there who can deal with the mental health or somebody in crisis or whatever else might be going on with that individual and at the same time link them with some resources to try to resolve the issue without continued police responses or interference with um, a business or a community member. This is one of the last slides that I have, maybe the last one, that I just wanted to give you uh, sort of an overview of what an average week is, uh, and just in terms of numbers of calls uh, that we experience. And obviously, there are much more that, that we do every day related to homelessness, quality of life issues, traffic collisions that are listed there, peace disturbances, those in a mental health crisis, civil disputes, other traffic-related issues, juvenile incidents, human trafficking, and the list goes on. And I've, I've said this before that it seems like very often that um, what seems like public safety and policing have become sort of the safety net uh, for, our, for our community in such a wide variety of issues. Um, and this is really stretches our resources um, in so many ways and it certainly impacts our ability to respond quickly in the way that we would want to, uh, be able to address things and, and find long-term solutions. Uh, and so really our, our work over the last two years in particular has really been to try to identify what these issues are that are causing our uh, absorbance of a large number of resources, stretching us across the organization, and across the city really, and how can we find other partners, other solutions, uh, and collaborative opportunities for people to come to the table with us to begin addressing some of the root causes that end up in policing responses and really find creative ways and try to be effective in the resources that we have. Ultimately, we know that what's most important to our community is that when they call us, that we come, and then we come quickly, and that we're, we're skilled, have the competency and the resources available to deal with the issue that they have at that moment, whatever that issue may be. And we're not able to do that to the satisfaction of, 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 of us and certainly of, of our community on a consistent basis. I am so proud of the men and women of the police department who go out every single day and are stretched in ways that I could not articulate here and do a variety of things every single day to protect this community, to address these issues that we're having. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we know that our community is hurting and suffering. Our businesses are suffering in a variety of ways. And we're really trying to find uh, new solutions and partnerships that can help us deal with many of these issues that are facing our community. Uh, we certainly stand ready to do that, um, and uh, we appreciate your support. We feel it. Uh, we know that you're providing us resources and are interested in helping us, and it's something that uh, our men and women feel, uh, and uh, I appreciate it very much. She is here. So if we, I can either answer some questions related to um, what I've just presented, or we can go on with the staffing and then have... Uh, Ms. Zimmer, come and present, and we can do that at the end, whatever you'd like. Chief, approximately how many people handle those 15,000 calls in a week, the average? Well, that's the number of calls that would come into the comm center, and so it, um, it comes into the comm center, and then it's triaged and distributed uh, across the... So like I said, over 775,000 calls came in to the comm center uh, last year. About 250,000 of those, I think, were... Uh, 911 calls. So that, I was just that was curious, like on a number. per person basis, it's a very large volume. So thank it you is. to everyone in the, call, in the comm is. center. Uh, Councilmember Parlier? I'm just going to wait until the briefing's over. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And Councilmember Smith, do you? Yeah, I just, a quick point. Appreciate everything you do in, in the department. It's just, when, when we look at these and, and it's just one year or two years, I've asked before, you know, can we see what the 10-year, the 20-year mm -hmm. trend is, you know, or 
would be helpful, I think. I'll have, I'll have a 10-year look in my uh, budget presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other requests right now. Welcome. All right, great. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council. Christy Tenter, Human Resources Director. And as the Chief uh, introduced, I will be providing a summary in support of the department on our strategies, goals, and accomplishments in the pursuit of increasing our sworn complement uh, these past three years. So we'll dive in and specifically put some framework around what the goal was. And our goal was in support of Council Goal 1, which is quality public safety services, more narrowly defined under PSVS, with hiring 100 officers over a three-year period. For perspective and some date sensitivity, we started this July of 2019, and at that time, we had 389 sworn positions in the Bakersfield Police Department. Now, I have to pause for a moment and say, this was amazing in itself. Each of you have talked about the benefits of PSVS and what that's brought to the city, but from an HR perspective, the excitement of knowing we can do this and we have the resources to do this. Many of my colleagues throughout the state were looking at defunding over the last three years or department cutbacks. And so having this opportunity to uh, understand the needs of the community and really put that emphasis on it was overwhelming at times. Uh, but to be honest, we had to take a pause when the chief and I had discussion of, well, how are we gonna do this? This was very different than our traditional model. We really had to consider the infrastructure that was in place and how we can do this better. And so I, I liken it to a, a journey, whoops, where you're going most days just fine, traffic's flowing, you get detours, stops, redirections. And ultimately though, if you just infuse 100 new individuals into that infrastructure, there can be some pretty catastrophic results. And so we had to really consider what do we have in motion? And there are 100 cars if you want to count them, but that's 100 saying if we infuse this into our work environment, do we have the cars? Do we have the technology? How do we just put this in all of a sudden? We really had to step back. And what we did specifically to address that was we said, what do we have in motion at the time in 2019 that really could apply and help us? Cannot underestimate the value of the training facility on California a Avenue. I, I would argue that if we did not have that center, we would not be even close to what we've accomplished today. Having the ability to have our own academy that we can schedule, that we can maximize. For perspective in the past, prior to that, we had to tag on to other facilities. And sometimes that meant the leftover spots Sometimes it meant less spots than we had hoped for, maybe only adding six officers when we wanted 20 officers. This was a huge accomplishment in pursuit of adding more staff, and we're very grateful, and it's been a huge benefit for our uh, process to date. So we had that already in motion. That was gonna open, that was great. We could start getting those academies. We had to be certified by post for how many people we can have an academy. So it's not just open an academy, there's a lot behind the scenes that has to take place. Now, we did other things that we had in the works. We tried to reduce steps to make it easier for lateral incumbents. Please come here, what can we do? Can we reduce your time out of office or travel time? Things like that. We have expanded our recruitment uh, resources and outreach, a lot of social media. Sometimes we have open houses here in the city council chambers where we ask people, do you wanna know more about the job? What can we do? Pre-workouts, things of that. Candidate text messaging, technology being a driver in recruitment is critical at this time in our modern day world. And having that ability to send out reminders, sometimes we find that some people forget that their exam's tomorrow and okay, we'll overlook that and send you a reminder. But those things are critical to communicate and be engaged with our workforce. Um, social media has been huge, having our PIO on both the PD and the um, city side big advancements there. But again, a lot of things were in motion, but we knew that to continue this at the scale we've been doing, we needed a more concentrated uh, communication plan. And so we've developed an applicant engagement team, members of the command staff in the police department that work with training, and members of HR key staff uh, meet by, first we started weekly, bi-weekly to just talk about who are we looking for? Where can we advertise? What do we have available? What is our image? Where do we need to go? How do we drive diversity? So many elements into that single number of, but we just wanna hire 100. 
but there's more to it than just that number. So we've been meeting regularly. So let's talk about what we've done from a perspective of um, year to date. But I would be remiss if I didn't share just a reminder for everyone viewing that what is the process to hire? I talk a lot about the academy, and those are what we know as the trainees, police trainees. That is our biggest bang for our buck, so to speak. That is the most uh, widespread opportunity we have to infuse headcount into our organization. Our, we'll talk about the number of laterals. Lateral recruitments traditionally have not yielded much in terms of volume, so we don't pull a lot of, of candidates in, typically one or two a year. We've done better. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But when we look at an academy setting, first and foremost, it's a regulated process. Uh, more so than typical hiring. So we have the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission post, which is a state agency, that says you must meet these guidelines and we will audit you. And so if you don't meet these screening criteria, you could be in jeopardy of failing an audit. And what would that mean? Potentially how we run an academy or if we can run an academy. So it's very important that we follow that protocol. Now, we can have, though, efficiencies into that protocol to make it more streamlined and an easier process on applicants. But overall, regardless of the effort we put in, it typically takes about six months from the time we have a job open to the time that an academy starts. And it's because of our life cycle. So we have a written exam, and that's the pellet B. And then they, those that passed advance to an agility, and then those go to an oral exam. And then there's the bat regulated background checks that can be very time intensive, polygraph examinations, medical, psychological exam. And again, when you start with a group of 1,000 and start to narrow it down, it takes a lot of time. And so again, we've had to really look at how does our infrastructure support that? So everything that we've been doing is to really get to this point of how do we get people into the system? So what have we been doing? So first and foremost, recruitment for sworn personnel, uh, I can liken to a new release of a Nike tennis shoe. For those of you in the market, there is high demand, low supply, okay? I have teenagers, I know this. At any time I go on governmentjobs.com, there are over 300 sworn positions posted for law enforcement in California. We're competing with that. If we're not present, if we're not timely, if we're not ready to move, we lose out. So there is a marketing campaign anymore that goes along with this. And so it's very important that we have the elements that we've been looking at. So initiatives. One, Cornerstone Communications has a uh, publicity that is called Behind the Badge. It tells the story of us. We want you to have a career here. We want you to know more about us than just the badge. So uh, Cornerstone has been really instrumental. They have over 123,000 followers on Facebook. They have Twitter accounts, LinkedIn accounts. They're telling our story. We've seen trainees that were DJs. We've seen them that were goat farmers. We've seen them that came from you know, other states and countries to move here. This is good stuff. If you haven't read the articles, we encourage you. This one is about one of our lieutenants um, who talks about why she is committed to BPD. This is the advertising that we want to show our community and our applicants in the future. So this is something that we've partnered over the last number of years to, to do. Revised police training and police officer job specifications. We needed to look at community policing. We just don't want someone that's in force and force and force. We need people that are engaging and in our community. So we updated that. That's the first view. That's the first thing that people see on advertising. Uh, hiring incentives. We've talked about that. The council has partnered in approving and letting us move forward in hiring incentives. Uh, again, those are far and few between up to $50,000 in some parts of the nation. We are uh, providing those now, and we believe they're a good benefit to the employees that we've uh, afforded them to. We're sponsoring trainees. My staff will laugh because they often say um, that I've been labeled as saying, I want to be the concierge of police trainee hiring. I think I've shared that with you as well, but we do. We want them to have an easy process, come back, stay, all those good things. So we are sponsoring them. Flashlights sweatpants, shoes, things that they need to be participants in the academy that's an added expense to their day-to-day -day living, we're affording them. Employee referral program, you can see, and I've provided in the past, in the bottom corner are QR codes. All Patrol is asked to carry the QR codes. If you find someone that you think is a BPD fit, share our job information. So we have an employee referral bonus because we believe that our, app, our employees are our best recruiters. So something there. Staffing of retired annuitants and human resources. 
Again, what's that infrastructure? Do we have enough people to do backgrounds for almost 500 people in a year? Do we have enough staff that can dedicate innovation and sharing of this information with applicants and mentor and help? We added staff to do that. Uh, retention and longevity bonuses. This overall goal is not just about hiring 100, but we need to retain. If we have a revolving door of those leaving, it, it, we don't reach our goal. So we have to focus on retention, and through that retention and longevity bonus that, that the council approved, we, we did see a, a reduction in retirements last year that we're very grateful that really helped us stabilize our numbers. Uh, continuous and live recruitment exam schedule, we're not taking our job postings down. They're staying up. They need to be up all the time. People need to know that our community wants, supports the blue and wants them here and that our jobs are available. And then expanded outreach and social media campaigns, banners all over town, um, looking at different diversity groups for posting, having ads in Poor Act continuously, really looking at what is the audience and candidates that we're trying to attract. And I'd like to share that our current academy has 13 female applicants. This is the highest and the most that we've ever seen. And we're really, um, we're really being those uh, behind the scenes cheerleaders to definitely say we, we want, that's who our workforce is. We want to have a workforce that represents our community. So we're excited to see that some of this is translating to positive uh, trends. Advertising, as I mentioned, it, it's like a multi, you know it's like a Super Bowl commercial. We've got to be present and there. Uh, we've done banners all over town. We've done banners on the Get Bus all over town, talking about it. Again, QR codes. We took an existing vehicle that's been allocated to PD in the past, and we've made it a recruitment vehicle. Um, that still will be utilized by staff, but again, it can go to job fairs. It can go to, um, it's just driving around town. You can snap that QR code, learn more about our job. So anything we can get uh, more attention for our advertisement and drive them back to our website. And that really is our most uh, innovative and results-driven addition over the last three years. Last October, we were able to launch our own dedicated BPD website for hiring, and it's joinbpd.us. And all the major cities have, if you look at, you know, San Jose has San Jose BPD or PD hiring. So it's very important, again, to make it easy for the applicants. So we needed to have that search engine results. So when you type in Bakersfield or police jobs in Bakersfield, it would take you to HR or take you to the city page. It didn't get you where you really needed to be and there wasn't enough information. Now if you go here, you can connect with mentors, you can see benefits, you can see bonuses. It's a one-stop shop all um, for uh, hiring in uh, our sworn rank. So we're really excited. We'll keep doing that. We'll get statistics on who's visiting, who's applied, how can we improve. So again, a lot of results that we're seeing out of that website. So where does that come? So what we've been doing, what does that actually translate to? So since that 2019 start, we've conducted five uh, BPD police trainee academies. Our most recent just started on March 28th that had 35 um, incumbents start on day one. In terms of our lateral, again, we're not closing that. We have it open continuously, but our police academy graduate lateral we have hired 11 in the last three years. Again, that's the most we've ever seen. We're typically one year, if that, but 11 in the last three years, um, good trends. We have one pending a start that's in our process. We have two more in background, continuing to receive those applications. So if we look all in all, we've hired 218. A little tired, a little excited. It's a mixed emotions, but uh, we've hired 218 that have actually been onboarded come to day one of employment and made it through that full cycle of the applicant process. What does that mean for our goal though? So we've hired 218, what does that mean? Well, we started with an authorized headcount in 2019 of 438. We had 389 filled at, the at that time. We currently have an authorized headcount of 507. We have 469 employed. We have three pending in offers. So by the close of this three-year period, June 30th, we will have a net hire of 83 individuals added to the complement. Now, a lot of excitement, a lot of looking back at, we've done a lot, we've made a lot of progress. 
but we know a goal is meeting the goal. We have not met the goal. We have, hired, we have had a net increase of 83. Our goal was to, meet, was to have 100. We understand that, and so we will continue in pursuit of that goal. As we reflect back on differences, changes, why didn't we meet? What happened with 218 and moved it back to where we are today? We share a few takeaways from environmental considerations that we've given. Not at all to be a list of excuses, but things that either didn't exist in 2019 or that we have had direct feedback from staff or applicants that made a difference. And so first of all, the great resignation. And so what that is for those of you who have followed, the very broad definition is in 2021, 33 million people were reported as leaving the job market. Now, regardless of the reason or the whys, there's many out there statistically that people are, are guessing at why people left, but overall, the public sector has taken a harder hit in that. Many, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, government uh, entities across the nation are reporting the most vacancies today as in, compared to the last 20 years. Over 1.5 million left government sector, 45% increase from 2019 to 2020 in retirements. Our numbers were not at, at that level, but we did see increases, we did see changes, we saw departures, we saw our, a little uptick in our uh, retention rate. So, was that a cause? We had one trainee who came in, was doing great in the academy, and said, I'm quitting today. I'm going to go be an engineer. That was not a screening question. No offense to engineers, um, Councilmember Smith. That was not a screening question or something we anticipated, nor something we could argue or defend and say, wait, stay with us. It was just a choice. That person said, I just want to go do something different. So we're competing with some of this, whether it's the effect of just, what do I want to do with my life, or is this the right decision? We've had that happen in the academy. And so the great resignation, did it play in? Perhaps. COVID-19. COVID-19... Um, had an impact on many facets of operations for our sworn individuals. But as a recruitment perspective, we saw a considerable drop in applicants. So we had about a third less of applicants actually apply during COVID-19 periods. And we had a, a, a very large increase in the number of, uh, I can't come because I'm in quarantine, I can't come to a test because I, I'm positive, or I just don't feel comfortable going into large settings or out in the community at all. So again, we had a lot of periods during this three-year time zone that COVID did have an impact to our operations. So was it one, was it more? Again, it did show lower uh, recruitment levels. National protests, the, um, the death of George Floyd in 2020 definitely had an impact on police staffing and police uh, the view of policing in communities in general. Uh, Forbes described it as the great police exodus. Some uh, cities such as Seattle said, we're in a staffing emergency. We, we can't have anyone else leave or we will not be able to provide services. So again, how do those things translate to applicants? Do they feel supported? Is this a job that they feel long-term they have an association with? We unfortunately had a death of a uh, deputy sheriff out in Wasco. And we had a trainee, again, a great trainee doing well that day that came in and said, I have to quit because of what happened. My family cannot cope at home today, and I can't tell them otherwise. I have to quit today. So when we see these outside things happen, they do translate in different ways to the families that support our, our sworn personnel. And so they do have impact, not always large, but some. Qualified immunity, I will not give the legal opinion, I will save that for another discussion, but qualified immunity, the state made a change in uh, 2021, basically with more uh, impact to sworn personnel individually on civil rights violations. Now, was that something that we saw in Exodus? No. Did we get feedback on it and concerns of how will I be uh, supported in these matters, especially in light of the protests, what will happen to me? It's something that police officers are thinking about nationally, especially in the state of California with the governor making that change of how will I be protected? What does this translate to? So again, how are people viewing entering the police career or staying in the police uh, career long term? Department of Justice. So as you all know, we entered into a stipulated agreement last year with the Department of Justice. Not here to give any uh, definition or opinion on that matter, but those in the department do. And that is not something that is uh, present in all police workforces. And for some that have been in the department, that has been a negative. They have said, I don't want that monitoring. I don't understand. I can go work somewhere else and potentially not have that oversight. So again, does it automatically translate to we didn't make 100? 
but was it a contributing factor? Presumptive changes, presumptive changes, uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, was added as a presumptive under the workers' compensation law in California uh, in 2019. We have seen a slight increase in industrial disability retirement and claim status. So presumptive illnesses are in sworn capacity where we see that we have a more, there's a propensity or likelihood that it was a work-related injury. And so that's another thing that we've seen in terms of those leaving the department. The last two, geographic and local economy, we saw that with the state reported a 12% a uh, decrease in population for moving out of California this year. And we've, we've heard about it. We've had officers that have moved, not because they don't want to be police officers at BPD, but because they don't want to be in California or they want to go to Texas and be a police officer. We have had resignations. We've had talk that there's as many as 18 in some type of background check right now to leave the state, not just BPD, but leave the state and pursue that career. So that's something that we're up against. Local economy, we've always articulated and advertised that we're a great community with a great cost of living. So we may not have the, all the perks of a big town in some ways, but we have a great cost of living. Well, we've seen that some local economists have said the housing market is up 27%. Um, there's very low rental uh, uh, availability right now. And so again, that's another struggle for us to articulate to applicants to get them to move here or stay here when we're not able to, to use some of our standard language in what we can provide as an organization. Lastly, compensation and benefits. One, compensation historically has trended a little on the low end, and so that's something when we're competing, especially with laterals or someone who graduates an academy, we want to retain them, not have them just go somewhere else. So compensation is a factor we'll continue to address. Benefits for the laterals, that definitely can be a preclusion to joining Bakersfield. Uh, some of you may recall Measure D that changed some of our pension values. We now have PEPRA. So we saw probably on the news many, you know, seeing the uh, conversations at the county about come join the sheriffs, we'll take you LA. Well, we're a different pension system and we've had a lot of conversations. I've done outreach with LAPD to say, let's hire but we have a different pension system. And so there's many that are not willing for the base rate of pay to come here and have that what they see as a loss in their pension or start over in their pension system. Again, these are just highlights of landscape changes or considerations that we've thought of, of why we're not hitting the number. It does not mean, it's not a one size fits all. It's not that we saw any one that drove more than the other. But again, we had five academies. If we just lost someone for one or two of those reasons each, that comes close to that you know, shortfall from 100 that we were looking at. So again, just sharing that information back. So we'll continue. We are gonna continue on early engagement efforts. We wanna connect with candidates to want them to be vested in our community and our Bakersfield Police Department. We'll continue to drive physical fitness, uh, readiness to help with that first few weeks in the academy where we can see the higher dropout rate continue to focus on can we assist with relocation, sponsoring the trainees, more job fairs now that we can be out and about and people are active again having job fairs. Um, we have the city class and comp study come up, coming up that may help with that process. And the last is ESOF. It's a request under PSVS this year and it's an automated software system that specifically will help streamline background check processes. For PD, sometimes our officers have to drive to other communities down south to look at file reviews. That can be hours and hours away from our community, but required uh, to do. This will have a software sharing capability where those documents are secure. We're hoping this can greatly reduce one, staff time, and two, the applicant time to wait for a response on their application status. Overall, promote, promote, promote. We each can have a role in promoting the jobs that are available, our great Bakersfield Police Department and all of its members. And so wherever you have your opportunities as you're engaging with the public, we would just ask and remind, please promote and uh, refer and recommend. So with that, I thank you very much for your time, for the chief, his staff's commitment to this process, and to all of HR who've contributed in the hiring of our sworn personnel. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tinter. Do we want to have some questions and answer? You want uh, Ms. Zimmer to come now and provide her update? Then we can. Councilmember Parlier. 
Yeah, Chief, might as well just take care of it in-house first. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for you and your team. You're just doing a great job. We see the, the numbers going up, uh, but we know that your staff are, are really working, working really hard. Uh, so last week, or was the week before, uh, Safe Neighborhoods did a tour of uh, your dispatch and also the, the, the city county shared dispatch for fire. And I'm going to start there because every, as you put it, every emergency that comes in the city starts with a 911 dispatcher and goes from there. And it was really eye-opening, uh, not only that, uh, and looking at the calls, I mean, you have a small complement of really dispatchers. What's the complement of dispatchers that you currently have? Not talking about what HR says you have, but what you have available right now. We have seven vacancies, so there's 32 or eight vacancies. I think 32 of the 40 dispatcher positions are filled. So 32 handling 14,000 calls a week, is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost a million in a year or three quarters wow. of a million. So in talking to them, I, and I potentially see this, and I think I'm in line with my colleagues on the committee too, is a potential weak link in the chain uh, with just our dispatchers and retaining and keeping these quality personnel that we have because uh, those dispatchers are, at least when they start too, are paid at a rate that they can leave and go to Target or Amazon and not be under a high pressure uh, job and, and make more money. And wh what's it take for a dispatcher to really get their feet underneath them? Is it six months or it's a probationary period? I'm sure, you know, it's a pressure cooker job. It is, there is a one year probationary period and, and that's been one of our traditional struggles is that um, it is a very difficult job to do. Uh, and we have seen historically many dispatchers get seven, eight, nine months down it uh, and just not be able to grasp dispatching over the radio and we've had to uh, let them go for not passing probation. Um, two years ago, the council uh, approved the creation of the call taker position within the communication center, and that is uh, allowed us to maintain uh, some better stable staffing levels within the communication center, uh, because that is a position that you can promote from to a dispatcher, but you can, uh, it's in sort of an entry level position into the comm center where you can have the interaction with the community, you can answer 911 calls and work toward being able to dispatch over the radio, which has traditionally been one of the most difficult uh, portions of that job. Well, as Christy pointed out, uh, the labor market has changed too. Mm -hmm. And you know, jobs that people would have looked to, oh, it's a public, public job, it's public safety, I can help my community, maybe I get retirement on it. But with those shift in, in pay, work from home, um, again, you could go to Target or Amazon and make substantially more money uh, for a rudimentary job, potentially, uh, not to mention a host of others or other jobs that afford them to be able to work from home and make the, the same or better money too. Um, so later on, we're gonna move on to another question, Chief, but I'm gonna make a referral uh, at the end of council tonight, and hopefully uh, the council will be able to address some of these issues within your department with dispatch. Thank you. Thank you. So you brought up to, and, and Cindy, I'm sure, will touch on this. Too. I'm sorry, District Attorney Zimmer will, will touch on this too. Um, just the fallout from prison COVID releases, AB 4757, and a host of other things. Can you just talk about what you perceive as uh, the problem. I, you said that the repeat offenders that traditionally would have been in prison that are now out, but I think there's a little bit more detail to that. Well, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, there is some important context to be provided to that. There are, we are arresting people multiple times for offenses. Not long ago, uh, there was a news release of, a, of an individual who was arrested for driving a stolen vehicle in possession of narcotics. He was arrested and booked into the jail. The very next day, we arrested him for driving another stolen vehicle. That is an example of things that happen frequently. Um, many of the homeless-related calls and, and mentally ill individuals and the, those that are, uh, have serious substance abuse issues that um, commit criminal acts, we're engaging with them repeatedly. And some of the fallout of these uh, propositions has 
been where uh, individuals who, absent these propositions, would have been incarcerated and able to, pr to receive and really be required to receive uh, substance abuse, mental health care inside while they're incarcerated for 90 days, 180 days, whatever the case may be, those, uh, that, no, that circumstance or environment no longer exists. Those services are still available to those individuals, but um, when they um, get convicted or plead to something, um, there is no longer a, uh, anything hanging over their head to mandate or require them to go participate in this treatment. And so they don't do it. And um, perhaps uh, DA Zimmer will speak to some of this. There are uh, examples after example of people failing to appear for very minor offenses, but chronically offending and, and really causing problems in the community. And, and our, from our perspective, it certainly isn't the answer to just lock everyone up. That doesn't solve the issue. There are many uh, serious underlying issues related to mental illness and substance abuse where these individuals need treatment so that they'll um, not be uh, offending and, and committing crimes and creating uh, uh, and disrupting the quality of life of our businesses and community members. But um, there are no longer, the reality is there's no longer those circumstances exist where they're having to serve time and able to receive treatment uh, while they're incarcerated. Again, the treatment is available, but they're not required to attend it. And if they don't, there's really no consequence to it. Is there anything the council can do? I mean, granted, we're not gonna get much help from the state probably, but is there anything we can do as a council to assist you in, if you had a wish list, can you name anything? Well, you really what you're doing, and I, I tried to speak to it a little bit today as I talked about, uh, our, our approach has really been to recognize um, the, the public safety challenges across the country, or across the, across the city, I identify what, what are some of the root causes of some of those issues? And the council has been very supportive in creating uh, or approving us to go out and establish partnerships and being able to fund some of these uh, examples. Trans West Security that was able to step in and fill the gap uh, in really an, a, at an important time in our community to address quality of life and chronic issues across the city. Uh, being able to, again, like I said, a, approving these partnerships and allowing us to divert uh, some of these um, non-emergency things that we're responsible for um, uh, and enable us to focus on more of those priority things. We're trying to look as many of those uh, opportunities that are out there and the council has been very supportive of that uh, so far and we appreciate it. Now on ShotSpotter, are there any other areas that maybe are adjacent to our, our you know, statistically the areas that we have the most shootings and stuff that we can even expand that? Yeah, the, the six square miles that we're currently covering, those have histor those historically are the areas where of the city where most of the frequent, or, um, where gun violence and injuries associated with gun violence most frequently occurs. There's no question that it occurs in other parts of our city as well, but not at the same level as it does in this particular area. Shot spotters started in safe neighborhoods, uh, the committee. So at some point, uh, Christian, if we could do an update, maybe, and just kind of touch on ShotSpotter a little bit, and if there's any any areas where we can expand it, I don't think it's necessarily for a conversation here, but um, have your team look at uh, areas around the, the current areas, Chief, that maybe we could we could look at, or maybe there's some area outside of that that would be advantageous to be able to do that also. Okay. And the the last thing, when you talked about partnerships and stuff with the state releases, uh, how's paroles been with with parole violations and stuff like that? Is it a revolving door now or is mm -hmm. it? Yeah, our partnership with parole is good. Uh, the reality is and their ability to partner with us to um, keep people in custody who are um, committing uh, serious crimes or serious violations, um, that is just not the issue, not the case at all. Uh, people who do not go into custody for parole violations for any length of time. And sometimes, even when they're called into the parole office, they leave uh, when the officers do. So you're saying crime and punishment is lacking now? Seriously. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chief. Christy? Christy, thanks again for your team, all their hard work. 
you know, hiring 100 police officers, I mean, what a gigantic task and uh, with a small team too. And I know you're doing great work and I just wanna thank you so much for that. I uh, wanna to touch on laterals real quick. Uh, the county offers 25,000, I believe, for out of area lateral or laterals from anywhere. Um, what do we offer laterals? For, for uh, Mayor Commissioner, um, Council Member Parley, we are at $4,500 at this time. If we were in line with the county, would we get any more laterals? Or I know like you said all the way up to 50,000 for some areas in the state. I, I do not believe that that would be an automatic transition to an increased applicant pool for laterals. And I would go back to the information I shared earlier on some of the perceived or, or real disparities in benefit programs. So again, when we start looking at other agencies, and I use LAPD because there's been more focus and they had more in the media about potential layoffs and we pursued them quite actively and they're one of the largest jurisdictions in California. But again, that because they, because they were not in a CalPERS and they're not a reciprocal agency, we can't meet that. So I don't, as that is an isolated example, but still a real example, I do not see that upping a hiring incentive would provide that increase because they're going to, they're still going to have to start over their pension. There's still going to be a, a different pension program. And now they're running two concurrent pension programs. I, the chief and I have had conversation as well as city manager um, and I on how, how are funds best utilized if that is our focus? If we're really targeting lateral recruitments, then are there other benefits that potentially would serve us better? Again, aside from maybe the 25,000 that you're referencing at the county, again, the council supported and we have put into place our longevity program where starting at- I was gonna mention that, my next story. Which is much more lucrative for a career-minded yeah. uh, individual who if they stayed from, you know, starting at year five and they start building up through those tiers can have an excess of 25,000. So again, through our research and discussions internally on our applicant engagement team, we really see that the 4,500 at this time covers initial transition costs, uniforms, things of that nature that may need to be purchased in advance. Again, to go back to your original question, I, I don't see that that would be a significant Ben, uh, benefit to the lateral pool in that one isolated action. Okay, well, you brought it up too. So on the uh, retention pay, yes. how's that helped? Keeping Last those tenure you know, folks that are already trained and uh, it's helped. Has Last it? year was a good year for retirements. It, and what I mean, not for the retirees, but for us to retain re and not have retirements. We had several indicate, I'm not going to retire. I'm going to hold out and have the benefit of this and stay another year or two. And otherwise so, they would have been out the door, probably. Yes, we had several in higher positions, especially when you look at it, you know, the, the top 9% of our workforce could leave tomorrow. They're retiree eligible. So they, they're they here for the community and for the service and uh, maybe some other things, but they, they definitely could leave with their full retirement tomorrow and they didn't. And so we do know uh, that there were several that made that elected choice. And a department, the police department's a young department, so it's good to keep that institutional knowledge around, I would think. It is. When I first joined the city back in 2011, we were somewhere in the 16 years average service. Now we're closer to eight, but the majority of employees uh, have less than five years. So it is a young department. Yeah, it most is. Most definitely. And we keep bringing in with the academy, so yeah. yes, it's a young department. And a lot, of a lot of people don't realize keeping that institutional knowledge can help keep us out of liability also yeah. by, by training those younger folks. I was a very strong supporter of a retention and longevity for that reason. Understanding and that transition of knowledge and succession planning, which the chief staff is currently undergoing through some of our other initiatives, uh, is definitely a positive move in my estimation. Good, so the council did good on that one, huh? I'd like to tell you all thank you, and you did good. <laughs> you did good. Thanks. Um, besides the 25000 getting away from that, just outside the box thinking for laterals, is there anything else that they've talked with Christian or the chief? Just, hey, if we just did this, that could potentially help. 
I would go back to the, the classification compensation study that's coming. I think that any potential compensation where there's better market equity or, or supported market equity to really be able to show that we're in, in line other than just the assumption that maybe we're not or if we need to realign, then we have that data to go from. I do think that that's going to be a, a significant. In part of that, we will also be looking at total compensation factors and some of our monetary benefits. And so I, I t time is of the essence and I know we need to hire now, but I also would like, I would like to defer and see some of that data come back. So when we look at some of our vacation programs and things of that nature, that's part of a lateral discussion. We've even had that in the miscellaneous ranks where someone has 300 hours of sick leave or vacation leave in their current job because they've been there a number of years. They're going to come here and start at zero. That's, that's difficult, especially when trying to balance family and, and work life um, in strenuous occupations. And so I think those are some of the items that we may want to more closely look at, again, for that attraction and retention perspective is how do we compare on paying out of some of those benefits? If you have these large banks, do we need to do some modifications to those? Those are some items that I think we've discussed internally, but again, I feel should be well supported with data from the study once we look at the comp and class outcome. Thanks, Christy. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Parlier. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I have a few comments. I'm gonna try to be short, and I will ask City Manager Clegg if during the budget presentations, if we can build in enough time, extra time to dig in a little deeper with the police department. Um, just just an initial comment. You know, when Measure N passed and when we established the goal of 100 net gain of police officers, um, we knew that it was ambitious and we knew that it was a lofty goal, even in fair weather. What we didn't know was that we were headed into a global pandemic that was gonna slow everything down for two years. And even despite that, we have hired 218 police officers. That's incredible. We have a net gain of 83. We're very close to our goal. And I want the community to be very clear that we will get to a net gain of 100 officers plus, and we will do that soon. And in fact, if you consider, and for those doubters out there uh, 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 regarding Measure N, if you consider if Measure N failed, we would, had a, we would have had a loss of 135 officers over the last three years. Think about that. All of the various different uh, priority calls that are increasing, the, the violence that's increasing with a smaller complement of over 100 officers, that is a scary, scary scenario. We had uh, 389 officers in 2019. Since then, we've lost 135 to retirements, people moving, uh, various different reasons. Um, how would we have, really, how would we have been able to fill those positions without the academies, without their new resources, without Measure N? So I am very thankful for all of the voters in their wisdom for approving the Public Safety and Vital Services Initiative. And I recognize that there is a lot of concern right, right now regarding crime, regarding the rise in crime, and we need to do whatever we can to address it. Um, but let's not discount or uh, throw away the value in uh, the investment we're making through PSVS. So thank you um, to the Human Resources Department, to the Police Department for all of your efforts. And really, I said it before and I'll say it again, Human Resources really is the unsung hero here. Uh, you know, they have done a lot of work in the background to make these academies go, to recruit, to uh, you know, make it easier for all of these applicants. Um, and I really appreciate you and your, your team, Christy. So please extend that message to your team. Um, I had a, an opportunity to go on a ride along Monday night actually with uh, Sergeant Galvin and um, had a great experience. We, there was a number of incidents that, um, that were really striking to me. You know, it is incredible how many resources we invest, colleagues, in a very small population of people. Um, you know, there was one incident where it was a, a gentleman who threatened to shoot his neighbors and shoot police officers and he, uh, uh, you know, clearly was demonstrating behavioral health challenges, and it required 
at least 10 police officers at the scene and for well over an hour and a half. Um, and you know, I imagine those incidents occur all of the time. And so the, the more we can invest in the behavioral health aspect uh, in, to, to, in response, uh, I think the better off we are. So I really appreciate uh, the chief and uh, leadership in, in looking at those um, you know, behavioral health strategies and interventions. The other, the other thing I was really impressed with was how, um, um, how skillful uh, the sergeants were at the scene of this particular incident near Jefferson Park um, where they really took the time to strategize, to think clearly, to understand the implications of various different strategies. And it really was uh, heartening to me and, and uh, I was very proud of the police department for, for how thoughtful they were given this situation and given this gentleman and the behavioral health issues that he was demonstrating. So again, Chief, kudos to you and kudos to all those who were there at the scene on that night. Um, Chief, I do have a question for you. Um, as we move towards uh, 100, officer, 100 officers, we know that um, our city will continue to grow. We have you know, population increase year after year. Um, do we have a standard currently of per, uh, police officers per capita or per 1,000? And um, if not, what should that number be? Maybe you have an answer, maybe you don't. But can you give me some insight there? And what, how are you thinking about the future growth of the complement over time as we continue to grow? Councilmember Gonzalez, thank you for the for the comment, um, and uh, I will certainly pass that on to the men and women because um, what you've just described happens a dozen times a day mm -hmm. across this city, um, and th those resources that were needed at that scene to deal with that incident that means that those resources were not in other places, right. and these calls were continuing to come in, and so uh, but it is important, and we take very serious our responsibilities to protect and care for, for this community and, uh, and ensure that we're equipped to handle all those circumstances. So I appreciate you taking the time to come out and ride along. Um, and uh, I know that you didn't mention it, but I will front you out. I know that you visited the academy today. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we appreciate that uh, very much as well. Um, there is no magic number uh, for a police officer per thousand ratio. Um, the city council has sort of had a historical goal in the past of 1.3 per thousand. Um, I think with our current complement, um, I don't know whether it's the authorized complement or the filled positions, we're just under that 1.25, 1.28, something like that. Uh, so we're getting closer to the historical council goal. We, uh, the council approved and we did uh, a, a facility study last year. Uh, with that was a staffing study to look at um, the workload uh, of, the, of the police department, our deployment strategies, how the workload is distributed across the department, both on the sworn side and the professional staff, uh, across every division of the department to come up with a number, uh, a projected number for five years, 10 years, out to 20 years. So we do have some, uh, some good studies now. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, very soon I'll be uh, sharing more of a, an analysis of that as we as we continue to digest that. But looking at just in the next five years, we're, we're with 100, if we can make it to 100, we're within probably a dozen or so positions that they projected that we would need um, within at, at the five year mark. Now, we're, they started with, I think, 2019 data, so uh, it'll be just two years from now when we will have uh, need that a dozen or so uh, increase in a sworn staff. So we're close to what their assessment was based on the current, based on what the workload was two years ago. I appreciate that. I think there's a need for us to have a conversation at the council level with you, Chief, about some of our expectations moving forward in terms of community policing and the presence that we would like to see, for example, in downtown where we um, you know, in the past had a bike patrol mm -hmm. that was able to provide some presence, right? Um, some more community oriented practices, you know, that's above and beyond, you know, the current level of, uh, 
of, of staffing. Uh, and, and so I, I would like us to explore what would it take for us to get to kind of this, this um, enhanced level of, uh, of staffing so that we can, again, engage the community in a more productive way, perhaps uh, do some preventative work. Um, so I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Okay, look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Councilmember Gray. Just real, <clears throat> excuse me, real quickly with time and we wanna be able to hear our DA. But I wanted to just say thank you again to all of the brave men and women that serve us every single day. Um, I, it's been a real eye opener being on the council to really understand what goes on out there every day. I did have the privilege to do right along about 10 years ago and that was a real eye opener. So mm -hmm. I, I would like to do that again. But I just wanna encourage my colleagues um, We've made a lot, of process, a lot of progress, but there's so much more progress to be made because our crime rate is up, it hasn't gone down. So when we go into this next budget season, which we're starting that process now, um, looking at measure in to be, really be careful of how we're spending those hard earned dollars of our taxpayers because they voted for this measure primarily because of public safety. That was the number one thing that they wanted, was public safety and wanted to increase our department. And then also going in, talking about our general fund, the same thing. I am so grateful that we leave, live in a city that we are not trying to defund our department, or we're trying to fund. So I just want to en encourage everyone to keep our mind on this report today that we saw. Let's not lose track of what we've heard here today because there's so much work left to do and we've got to have the dollars in place to do them. So thank you, Chief. I, I appreciate you. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. DA Zimmer. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Goh, members of the council. I was asked to come talk about how the laws in California have impacted public safety. And I can tell you that the change in the laws in the last 10 years have greatly impacted public safety in California and in Kern County. I'm also here, I, I don't work for the city of Bakersfield, I work for the county of Kern. Um, and so uh, the police chief, Greg, uh, police chief Terry, um, talked a lot about the statistics for Bakersfield. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more countywide, but I will tell you what happens in Bakersfield and when there are homicides in Bakersfield, it has a direct impact on Delano, Lamont, Arvin, and vice versa. So we really are not a huge um, uh, state, I mean, a county, I know that we have uh, East Kern, but here in West Kern, what happens in Bakersfield has a great impact. Um, crime is changes with politics. And the pendulum of justice, I like to call it, changes, it goes left and it goes right, depending on who's in Sacramento, who's in the legislature, and who the governor is. And it has a swing and it has swung greatly and it is, we've seen a lot of increase specifically in the last 10 years. Why have we seen an increase in violence, drugs, theft and homelessness? You have to look back at the history of crime in the last 100 years in California and that pendulum, pendulum has swung left and right. We look at the 20s and 30s, it was a tri time of great lawlessness in California. Then we had the war and a shift to a very pro-law and order thinking, and it was reflected in Sacramento. Then in the 1960s, and it was about the lowest rate, our crime rate in the early 1960s, but in the 1960s and 17s, crime really increased. And we had, probably our peak in crime about the time that Governor Brown left office in 1983 
and Governor Duke Machen took over in 1983, and crime was at about its worst per capita in those years from about 1983 to 1990. For about 28 years, we had laws that changed. We called that criminal justice reform one, where the crime was more law and order oriented. We looked at the victim. We looked at what uh, we thought would address recidivism. And then in the last 10 years, that movement has been flipped. It is going what we call more criminal, or um, how do we reduce the sentence of the guilty? I have been a direct eyewitness to what has happened in the last 38 years because I began my uh, work at the district attorney's office at the height in 1984 of uh, crime per capita. And uh, it's been get difficult to watch. What happened, what were the major, there were a lot of things that happened in that first period of time that um, made California safer and caused the crime rate to go down. The three crimes that had the greatest impact, uh, the three um, laws that had the greatest impact on crime were first, 1988 was the STEP Act. That made gang enhancements. That was Penal Code Section 186.22. It enhanced sentences for gang crimes. It created a special circumstance in uh, death penalty cases for gang crimes. And um, that was due to an explosion of gang crime in Los Angeles. We did not use gang enhancements for about another 10 years in Kern County until um, the Casa Loma shooting in 1999. It was about that time that we started the gang unit at the BPD, and that's when we started uh, gathering what we call predicates and beginning gang prosecution, but it made a tremendous difference for the en enhanced sentences. But perhaps the greatest piece of legislation, it was a proposition and a piece of legislation, was the three strikes law in 1994. That occurred because, uh, in part because of the kidnap, rape, and murder of Polly Kloss, that young girl from Petaluma uh, who was killed by someone who should have never been out of prison. A recidivist violent felony kidnapped that child and killed her. And her father, Mark Kloss, that you still see as a victim advocate, uh, was very involved in passing three strikes law, which increased punishment for recidivist offenders. And then in 1997, and there were a lot of different pieces of legislation, but these are the big three. In 1997, there was AB4, the Sandra June Peters Act, which enhanced sentences for those who chose to use firearms when committing violent felonies. There was a 10-year sentence enhancement for someone who used a gun during a violent felony, 20 years for someone that shot a gun during the commission of a violent felony, and life for someone who shot someone and committed a murder or great bodily injury. That was Penal Code Section 12022.53B, C, and D. So, I went back 30 years to give you a perspective, 30 years of statistics in homicides. Now, I have this for every county in California, but I pulled out four counties, Kern, of course, but Alameda County, that's Oakland, so that's a big city, and there's a lot of crime in Oakland. Fresno is somewhat comparable to us, about 100,000 uh, more and in the valley, and then there's Los Angeles County. Now, these numbers are a little complicated, but I, I want to talk to you about what they mean. So 1990 is about the height per capita of seeing some of these uh, violent crimes, and I didn't pull out all crimes, like the big ones, murder, rape, robbery. Um, I just did homicide, so we could look at that because it would become too complicated. But the first line going across for Alameda, going up for the first 10 years there, um, and I have circled 1994, because that's when the three strikes law was passed. You can see the, the raw data for the number of homicides that were committed in Alameda County. 188 homicides. The percentage for of homicides you break down for population, so it was 14.7 homicides per 100,000. So 
So that's how you read those two numbers as, uh, as you go across the right, the right uh, direction. The highest per capita rate that Alameda had in that decade was in 1992, which was 16.1. You look down into Fresno County, and you can see the raw numbers going across and the percentage for population. Fresno County in 1992 had 17.4 per 100,000. You look at Kern County, and you look across and you look at the percentage per 100,000. We had a lot less homicides, but we had a lot less population, too. And you look at our big year was 1994, 14.8. And then you look at Los Angeles. Look at some of those numbers, the bottom line, the percentage of, uh, of homicides per population, 21 per thousand. So um, it is, um, you can look at that and look at 1984 is when three strikes law passed and you can see the crime rate starting to go down. 1997 is the year that the 1020 life passed so with some of these violent felonies, you can see them start to go down. Look at the end of 1999 of how some of these crime rates went down. You look at the next decade of the year 2000 through 2009 and look at some of the percentages. And I'm here to tell you that the percentage of homicides per population has never been as high as it was in this decade, in the decade before. We have never gotten close. Even now, we all know that there are a lot of homicides in Kern County. Right now, we have the dubious distinction of having the highest homicide rate for any county in California, and Bakersfield plays a big part of that. But it's never been as high as it was in the 1990s. But it is beginning to increase because of the change of the law. So you can look at these, and you can look at Kern's um, averages going. Uh, we're at 12. We were at 12 last year. But you can look and see during these years of uh, what they were. I circle, for example, Alameda ranged from 7.3 to 11.4. Fresno ranged on a low side from 4.7 to 8.6. Each year is just a little bit different. Kern ranged from 5.5 .5 to 9. But for the mostly the 5, 6, and 7s in Los Angeles continued to go down, 11.7 in 2002 to 6.7. Now, one of the things I'd like to point out is, is in the 10 years from the time three strikes passed in 1994, there was a very exhaustive study done 10 years later in 2004, and how significant that the crime rate went down in that 10-year period of time. Alameda went down from 16.1 to 7.8 homicides per 100,000. Um, Fresno went 17.4 down to 7.9. Kern County, 14.8 to 8.6. Los Angeles went from 21.1 to 10.2 in 10 years. So what happened in 2011? And in 2011, um, 2012, 2014, and 2016, the pendulum started swinging the other way. Uh, the most significant piece of legislation was AB 109, realignment in 2011. And we knew, those of us in the law enforcement business, the DA business, throughout the state, we knew what was going to happen. Because if you understand what AB 109 was, it is a direct result of the increase, or the increase in homelessness is a direct result of AB 109. Prop 47 didn't help, but AB 109, because what it did, uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, and I'm sure you all are, but it's just a, a little review. Any, the conviction of any felony um, uh, carries the potential of serving one sentence in state prison. AB 109 changed that, which only allowed some felonies to go to state prison. And they were the violent and the serious felonies. So the murder, rape, robbery, that, those types of crimes, still, they went to prison. But what happened to the ones that sold heroin? The criminals that sold methamphetamine? The repeat car thieves? The embezzlement? the embezzlers, 
thieves, drug dealers. What happened when they were convicted? They served their time in the Kern County Jail. So the people that used to be in the Kern County Jail, they couldn't go to prison under AB 109. Hey, they had to do their time in the county jail. So who used to be in the county jail before AB 109? They were people who were waiting for trial, but after they were convicted, some would do their time. If they were a first-time car thief and they were on f going to get felony probation, they'd do their time in the county jail, but for the most part, they went to prison. Now all those people post-conviction are doing their time in the county jail. So who did that push out of the county jail? People that were there, first-time offenders and misdemeanants who had horrible drug problems. Horrible drug problems. That's who they, they're not in the county jail anymore getting rehabilitation or um, other types of programs, mental health programs, they're out on the street. So in 2012, Prop 36 diluted three strikes law. We still have a form of three strikes law, but it's not what it once was. In 2014 was Proposition 47, uh, which reduced many theft offenses to misdemeanors and uh, narcotics possession cases. They're no longer, you have possession of fentanyl, possession of heroin. Um, that used to be a felony, it's now a misdemeanor. So what happens on many misdemeanors when a person is arrested? Uh, many time, uh, back before AB 109 and Prop 47, they were booked into the county jail and bail was assessed. Um, now they're given a citation with a promise to appear. They do not appear. There is a failure to appear rate in the arraignment court of our uh, courthouse here across the street of upwards of 70 to 80 percent. So what we have are people who have horrific drug addiction problems that we cannot help. There was a time we were able to get people, uh, help them if they were willing to get help of rehabilitation, and if they weren't willing, the court would order it. But now they are repeated lost opportunities, and we are losing people to drug addiction. Um, our fentanyl overdose deaths from 2020 to 2021 uh, more than doubled, more than doubled in Kern County. We had over 230 in 2021. We had about 90 in 2020. So then um, the Prop 57 occurred in 2016, which um, does not now require um, inmates who are committed to state prison to serve their full term. Prior to Prop 57, the general rule was if it was a serious felony or less, you did 50% in your time. You got a 10 year sentence, you did five. If it was a violent felony, you did 85% of your time. And if you had a strike, one strike, you did 80%. Um, with Prop 57, those credits, um, they're, they don't do their time. They do that any type of anything near that. Um, three to four years on a 10, 12 year sentence. So these are the types of things that occurred during Governor Brown's time that created quite a change for us in the way we do business as prosecutors, but also we saw the crime rate go up. Uh, when Governor Newsom came in, um, we saw an increase in laws that uh, made it more difficult to convict the guilty and also um, provided uh, less, they got more time off their sentence. So what are some of the things that occurred in 2019, 2020, and 2021 so far with the, uh, this legislature and, and with Governor Newsom signing these um, things into law? Um, there was something, called, and there's so many of them, and I'll try to be brief in explaining it to you because I, I, I know it kind of gets an inside baseball, but um, there used to be a penalty for somebody that was a repeat offender, even a car thief. Car theft carries 16 months, two years, or three years in state prison. If you um, then go to state prison for car theft and you get out and you steal another car, there used to be a one-year enhancement for you going back to prison. So now that it was four years, if you did it again, it was five years, and that kind of thing. The legislature eliminated, eliminated that. Um, there's no difference between the way a recidivist is treated. Well, car thieves can't go to prison anymore anyway. But anyway, the, the one-year uh, prison progress, they were eliminated. Now we... Uh, we we are able to have felons on juries, which is, you know, in some circumstances, that's okay, because sometimes they're pretty good at jurors, actually, because they'll say, hey, I did my time. 
I, I pled guilty. I, w I was held accountable and I did my time, but it makes it a little bit more difficult uh, in some circumstances because some felons obviously don't, uh, didn't have a good experience with the criminal justice system. In 2020 is when the pandemic came. There were a lot of things that happened during 2020, but also some, the legislature did do some work during that period of time. They reduced felony probation from three to two years. That's really tough. Um, if somebody is doing drug rehab, there's only two years to get it accomplished. If they owe victim restitution, if they haven't paid by two years, that's it. Um, so it's, it's much more difficult. Um, there was a jury selection law that changed if someone comes in and says that they hate the police under many circumstances. DAs can't excuse them for cause. Um, there is misdemeanor diversion. So many, uh, I believe in diversion for many first time offenders. I think it is a very appropriate sentence, but this, the, this particular misdemeanor diversion I believe goes too far. It lowered er elder parole. So if you're, if you're convicted of a violent felony and you go to prison, if you're young, you get youthful parole. That's over and above what you get off your sentence. But if you're also gonna reach the age of now, not 60, but 50, you're now eligible for parole. So there's youthful parole, Prop 57, elder parole. Um, so there are just a number of ways that an inmate can get time off their sentence. What's interesting is the legislature lowered an elder defendant or an elder convicted felon from 60 to 50, but for a victim, it's still 50, 65. So a victim is elder, you know, when we're much older, but uh, for a convicted criminal, they've lowered it 50 so they can get out faster. Um, during the pandemic, the governor granted parole to numerous convicted murderers. We're seeing murderers out on the streets now more than ever. There was a time, regardless if the governor was a Democrat or Republican, that we ever saw someone convicted of first degree murder get parole. 20,000 inmates were released from state prison in the year 2020. Um, due to COVID and other issues, and then increase custody credits. That means they just they get out quicker. In 2021, we had a lot of different things that have uh, happened in 2021. The two big ones were that the gang crime that I told you about, pursuant to the STEP Act, PC 186.22, that has been greatly diluted. Um, this is a time here in Kern County where gang crime has never been worse. Our homicides have never been worse, and the majority of our homicides are gang related and our victims are people of color. And it's during that period of time that the California legislature and our governor decided to dilute the sentence for someone who commits a violent crime if it's related to gangs. And the gun enhancement of the June Peters Act, that's been greatly diluted. Um, it's not what it used to be and what we were able to do with that. So, um, we look at then the California homicides then in this third decade that we're talking about, and you could look at the same three counties about how they're going up, up, up. 2011, I drew the black line, that was AB 109. We expected things to start picking up, and they did. When you have a change in the law, it's not gonna be overnight. It's gonna be over time, just like it was over time when three strikes law passed. I've circled 2014, that was Prop 47. Uh, 2016 was Prop 57. And then uh, the red line is um, when we have the new uh, governor and the new legislature in 2019 and 2020, you can see the homicide rate in Alameda going up 5.7 to 8.6 in those two years. And you can see every one of those counties, the homicide rate going up. Now, um, we had a pretty bad year statewide in 2020 because of the pandemic. In 2021, Kern County remained the same, but most metropolitan areas were much, much worse. You can see LA in one year went up nearly 200 homicides. Uh, and then um, the statistics for that, I think they had 800 in 2021. So LA is, is really on fire. So just a, a couple more things. It's just really been disheartening for me. I'm an old drug prosecutor. Uh, that's what I did in the 80s. And um, what we were able to do, I think, to um, with supply and demand of narcotics, I think was um, important. And um, we can now not send, unless they have a strike conviction, we cannot send people who sell or possess for sale uh, illegal drugs to prison. They go to the county jail and the average stay is 30 days. 
few grams, a few kilos. If the federal government doesn't come in and help us and prosecute drug dealers in federal court, dealers get 30 days in the county jail. We were sending them to prison for nearly a decade prior to AB 109. So with the open border and fentanyl coming across, this is what you're seeing. Drugs pay these days. They are very valuable. We, used, we saw a long time ago that drugs were worth, worth a lot of money and then they, uh, they weren't as much and now um, th there's a lot going on in the streets. It's, it's one of the reasons we've seen so many guns because drug dealing is so profitable. Uh, drug dealers and criminals have a lot of money. We've had, we saw EDD fraud and a great increase in drug dealing. So there are a lot of guns, a lot of violence on the streets. So we've uh, lost our tool to do something to the drug dealers to get that off the streets. And then we've also lost the ability to help those who really need help. And those are the people that are addicted. And the opioid crisis has made it that much worse. You know, fentanyl is an opioid, so um, it's highly addictive and highly, uh, a, a big killer. So um, that uh, makes us very, very sad. And we see people that are so sad out on the streets. You know, I see one particular person that um, I see most days coming to work and I just look out my window and um, my heart breaks for her. As I can tell, she is um, in the throes of deep drug addiction. And there was a time she would have been in jail and some of the best rehabilitation you can get was in Lerdo, in the county jail. And so we don't have that anymore. So the laws have changed. Um, I think it's gonna get worse. I'm just gonna be straight out. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna come in here and say that it, it's, it's gonna get better. I don't see it getting better. Um, do we have the rates that we had in the 90s, the 80s? No, but we're, each year we're going up. And so the laws have changed. The laws are making it more difficult for our law enforcement to do their jobs. And it's making it harder for us to hold the guilty accountable. Thank you. Thank you, DA Zimmer, for your advocacy for justice and fighting for our community. Councilmember Parlier. Thank you, Mayor. District Attorney Zimmer, there are pro victim. Uh, DAs and there are pro criminal DAs and I'm so thankful that you're our district attorney because you are so pro victim you care so much about the people of Kern County and those that are victims of just heinous crimes uh, I've been on the walk uh, with you more than once uh, recognizing the victims of Kern County uh, there's so many sad stories that go along with that and to put those people in the same context of really predators that are out there preying on, in, in a lot of cases, and sometimes in most cases, of people really in underserved populations that need the help the most. And I just want to thank you so much for that. Is there anything we can do as a city, as a council, uh, to help support your efforts uh, in the county, maybe even too? I know the county is a different entity. But uh, the jail's a big problem, you know, even if we have, uh, can send somebody over there, that there's still an issue there. Can you address that a little bit, please? Um, Councilman Parlier, um, through Mayor Go, um, thank you for that question. Uh, as far as what you do to support us at the District Attorney's Office, it starts with the Bakersfield Police Department, and it was so... Um, uh, it was great to hear the presentation by the police chief and um, the lady from the city, I'm sorry, Christy. Christy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, about what you're doing uh, to try to hire more police officers. Um, the Bakersfield Police Department is an amazing organization. Uh, I'm, I know almost every officer, maybe not the young ones as much, but uh, what they do, they're, they're a tremendous agency and they have a great reputation. So for the council supporting this amazing agency is uh, probably one of the most important things that you can do, that you're not trying to demean them, defund them, humiliate them. Instead, you are supporting them and bringing them up. And so that, that helps us. That helps us with the quality of their investigations. 
and it helps us when we um, try to hold people accountable. As far as the interaction with the County of Kern, I think that we have a great working relationship, the council, members of the board. I know that we've done a lot of things before. We used to have a, a city county um, group back in the, uh, oh, about 10 years ago with gangs. Um, we're always open to do something like that, but it is difficult with realignment regarding taking who used to be in prison and uh, we've been doing their sentences in prison. Instead, they're doing them in the county jail. There's just, there's 1,800 beds at Laredo right now. There's 1,800 beds. You know, there used to be, uh, all the state prisons, they, they had 7,000 beds each. And all the you know, prisons throughout, and, and prisons are closing, and they, they have a, depending on what the prison, they have about 2,000 in each prison now. So there's, they're greatly, the prison population is greatly down. But, um, it's an issue, and it's an issue uh, of getting enough people that we can hire to be able to do the work. You were so right when you were talking about Sacramento and the laws. Uh, when I was in law enforcement with the state, uh, it didn't ma matter if you were a Democrat, Democrat or Republican, there was right and there was wrong. And I remember uh, when I was working for the Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement, of which Jerry Brown got rid of too, uh, and lost 500 agents that that did things, methamphetamine enforcement, heroin enforcement, fentanyl enforcement. Uh, but Diane Feinstein pushed for um, extra time for those involved in methamphetamine labs. And she was a Democrat, but yet she recognized uh, the need to uh, go after that type of criminal. Can you just talk real quick, when we're talking about narcotics, um, just the nexus between drug crimes and how that rolls into so many other crimes? Yes, I wanted to say that um, we have many Democratic legislators who care deeply about public safety. I was in Sacramento a couple of weeks ago on a bill in which we tried to make human trafficking a strike and we had bipartisan support on that and our Kern County legislators stood behind us on both sides of the aisle. So yes, as far as the relationship between drug crimes, uh, drug crimes and other types of crimes. We have uh, drug crimes contribute to homicides. We have an increase in what we call in drug deal gone bad. You know, those types of crimes where you have some sort of buyer and seller and it doesn't go well. You know, they're not always the most reputable people and are true to their word. And so you see a lot of violence there. That's on the uptick. Uh, you have people who are horribly addicted that are going to do anything that they can, steal or commit violent acts against others to get something, money, in order to uh, support their habit. So there has always been a relationship between illegal narcotics and um, drug crimes. We also have the issue of illegal pot shops, uh, marijuana dispensaries. They're very often the lo locale of homicides because you have very, very, uh, um, well, mafia, mafia people, you know, uh, people from different types of organizations that run these illegal um, organizations and you, you get a lot of crime in those as well. Maybe I should have framed that and said Sacramento used to have a lot more common sense <laughs> than, they, than they do now, regardless of party. Um, I know you work closely, have worked closely with our city attorney and, and yes. other city staff, but is there a regular working group or anything that, you know, I know you, your staff work with the police department all the time, but just on some of these issues that maybe the city can help uh, you know, partnership or shepherd different things with different departments within a county? Is there anything that we can... Well, we've, we've had a lot of different working groups. Luckily, we, are, we do work very well with the police department and, and the, the county sheriff. You know, um, in a lot of counties, uh, the elected DA and the police chiefs and the sheriff, they don't get along. And we all know each other very well. And I think we don't always agree on everything. But uh, we are fortunate in that regard that we do get along well. As far as working groups, I know that we are trying to do something regarding um, the, some of the, the homeless issues and what we can do as far as that goes. And we've been working about that, uh, about that, and I with that, and um, we've had a good relationship regarding off and on over time of um, of funding in order to uh, um, quality of life crimes that really affect so many people in Bakersfield. So is there a, 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 a working group, though, like currently regarding the city and the county? Sitting down? I mean, that, that might be a, a question that should be uh, between the police department and the sheriff. 
Um, but we work very closely, depending on what your unit you're in in my office, uh, the gang unit, we're over here at, at the police department at meetings regularly. Well, I know we provided some monies for some quality of life crimes before. Uh, did that help or not help? Or It certainly does help. Um, we, we, uh, we have a, 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 in the misdemeanor unit, we are watching those that are um, the worst offenders of the quality of life crimes. And when they come, we get an alert. We uh, have a computer program in which we look at those that have the most warrants. They're usually for quality of life crimes. And we try to uh, get the jail to keep that person for a couple of days so they can at least be in custody when they go to arraignment and have a lawyer and uh, be a, a little bit uh, less uh, under the influence to be able to make some good life decisions for themselves. Well, I asked for this public safety update because I thought it was really important for the council to hear and uh, in your words have uh, really underpinned you know, some of the challenges that we face. And I just thank you again so much for your time and uh, all the hard work for your department. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, DA Zimmer. I don't see any other requests to speak. Vice Mayor. Motion to receive and file. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Council Member Freeman absent. Thank you. And with that, uh, we stand adjourned at 519.